let's enjoy some time studying the Word of God. 1 Peter chapter 4, we'll look at verse 5, and we will look at verse 6. I am confident these two verses somehow tie together because verse 6 starts with the word the for, for this cause. And for there, it's spelled G-A-R, gar in Greek. It's a conjunction. And a conjunction is a part of speech that ties together a foregoing thought with a current thought. It unites the two. So, verse 5 and verse 6. Let me read you our text. Who, that's a pronoun, verse 5, first word. Who shall give an account to him? Somebody is going to give an account to him. And I am going to hold to the truth that the him there is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall give an account to him? To give account, it's apodidomi logos in Greek. It means it, it, it is a courtroom scene. Somebody is going to be called before the judgment bar of the Lord Jesus Christ who shall give an account to him. Every pronoun of necessity must have an antecedent. To what or to whom does that little word who apply? I think here we have to go back to our last lesson. In other words, to verses 3 and 4. In verse 3, the Gentiles. Peter taught us we used to live after the will of the Gentiles. We used to act like they act. But then we got saved. I need an amen here. And oh, have things been different. Wow. But the Gentiles don't understand that. They think it is strange that we no longer act and live like they do. And they think it's strange to this point. They begin to criticize us. I'll go stronger than that. They begin to blaspheme us. That's the word Peter used last lesson. More than that, in the day, first century Greek Roman life, Peter's day, the lost world had begun to persecute the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. But they someday are going to give an account for their actions. Oh my, let me tell you what's coming to my mind. Back in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, listen now. The Gentiles called us into account. Why do you believe what you believe? Uh, why is it you believe there's a tomb somewhere that a dead man was in it and it's now empty? Give me a reason. That's logos. Give me an account for why you believe there is a book with no mistakes. There is a book that God wrote. I'm calling you into account. Give me a reason why you think a dead man's now in heaven and is coming back someday. Give me an account. They called us into account. But here in our text tonight, verse 5, our Lord, who is our shepherd, our Lord, who guides us, guards us, and protects our Lord is going to call that crowd that's been so ugly, so mean, so bitter to the Christian. He's going to call them into account. Who shall give an account to him that is ready. To him. Hey, by the way, when will the heathen, the lost, the Gentile, when will the lost world be called to give that account? Now listen. I'm going to give you a term. It is a Bible prophecy term. It is a coming event. Write it down if you're a note taker. They will give this account at the great white throne judgment. 
there are two big ju uh, judgments looming in the future. One, Paul calls it the judgment seat of Christ. That's for Christians. That's for believers. It's not a judgment of whether I'll go to heaven or hell. I need an amen. That was established. That was settled the moment I trusted the blood of Jesus to wash away my sin. The moment the Lord saved me. What is the judgment seat of Christ? It's where the Lord Jesus examines my works, examines our faithfulness, and if we have been true to His name, if we have not denied His name, there will be rewards. There will be rewards given out for that faithful living for the Lord Jesus. Paul uh, illustrated this way. If I have been unfaithful, if I have not been steady, uh, if, I was, uh, uh, if I quit uh, in my church attendance or my, whatever it may be, if I am a failure as a Christian, my rewards will be like wood, hay, and stubble, a bunch of straw, chaff. But if I have been faithful, if I have lived right, if I've done my best, if I've loved uh, the Word of God, if I've had a consistent prayer, etc. Gold and silver and precious stone. All that, and we've discussed it before in our Bible lesson, Judgment Seat of Christ. But the Gentiles that are lost, the persecutors, those who've rebelled against them, they'll give an account at the great white throne judgment. Oh, I wish I could say more about it. Time is always of the essence. Hey, do this. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. John, to the eye of Bible prophecy, uh, is given witness to what it's going to be. The great white throne judgment. And he describes it. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. And all the dead. You notice verse 5 says, Our Lord is ready to judge the quick and the dead. The word quick, it, it is a present participle. Uh, Zao, Z-A-O. Uh, it means those who are still alive when Jesus comes back, if they're lost, they're going to be judged at the great white throne judgment. The quick and the dead, that explains itself. It is also a present participle. And, and uh, it, means, uh, it means the ones that Preacher, they're already in the grave. Oh, more than that. The dead, they're already in hell. If you die apart from Jesus Christ, you'll die and go to hell. Luke chapter 16 clearly illustrates and teaches that truth. So this is what's going to happen at the great white throne judgment. I really need you to read you a little bit of it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Hell right now it's terrible. It's a place of torment. It's a place of fire. But it is temporary in this sense only. God will take the souls, the unbelievers in hell, bring them to the great white throne judgment. Their works will be examined. The more wicked a man has been, the more severe his judgment, his punishment. And, uh, and then what happens to them? Verse 15 Revelation 20, 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, the book of life was cast, hurled, flung into the lake of fire, out of hell, great white throne judgment, and then thrown into the lake of fire for eternal, never-ending punishment, torment for rejecting Jesus Christ, the darling Son of God. Let me go back to verse 5. There is one that's ready to judge. That's Jesus. And the lost, these Gentiles, these persecutors, these haters of God will give an account, Logos. Their words will have to answer for their wicked living to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. Preacher, how do you know how do you know that it will be Jesus who will be the judge? Listen to this. John 5, 22. John chapter 5, verse 22. Here's what it says. The Father has given 
The Father has committed all judgment into the hands of His darling Son, into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And look at Jesus who is ready to judge. He is ready to judge. Uh, that is an adverb. Uh, the, the verb ready, ready, and it means prepared. In fact, it really means more than prepared. Eager. He's eager to judge the wicked. Living and dead. He's willing, eager to judge the wicked. I, I don't know how you can prove that, preacher. I do. Hebrews 10, verses 12 and 13. And a plethora, a host of other New Testament verses. All built on Psalm 110, verse 1. Here, here's Hebrews 10, 12. Paul said, this man... That's Jesus. This man, after he has offered one sacrifice for sins forever, that's Calvary, hallelujah. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his foot. So you know what Jesus is doing right now. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He is interceding and praying for you and me that our faith will be strong, that our faith will not fail. And he's also eager. I can see him. He's eager. He's anxious. He's expecting. That uses the verb decomy. He is excitedly waiting. Can't hardly. He's counting the days until he can come back again, till his enemies be made his foot, until he judges the quick and the dead. That's at least a, 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 and I think that right, the accurate reading of verse number five. Who, the wicked, I keep going back to the word Gentiles because that's the word Peter used. Uh, that word Gentiles can be translated nations, they're lost nations. It is also the word that can mean heathen. They'll give an account. To the, they called us into account when we were down here. They're going to give an account to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords on that great judgment day, the day of the great white throne. And Jesus is ready. He is ready. It goes beyond that decrement. He's eager to judge the quick and the dead. Depart from me. I never knew you. Now, that's verse number five. And I purposely left a little extra time to wade into verse number six because uh, honestly, it is a difficult verse to understand. Uh, we're in a little motel room. In fact, not really a little room. Bedrooms over there with a door that can close. That's a little kitchen area. Uh, Debbie's been able to cook uh, this week while we're here. And uh, I've just sat up here in the, uh, in the living room, the camera, the tripod's in the living room. You can see the background. And uh, uh, I have been studying for some time, yesterday and today, what does verse 6 mean? Peter once said this. Oh, I want to share this with you. I think it's sweet. I almost think it's humorous in a godly sort of way. 2 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16. Peter gets to talking about Paul. Listen to what he calls him. Our beloved brother Paul. And then he gets to talking about Paul's epistles. In all his epistles. And then he says this. Talking about Paul. And I think it's a statement of admiration. Paul's writings, brilliant mind, man that knows God and his walk with God, his constant desire is to know Jesus better and better. He's written some things, quote, hard to be understood. Peter said, sometimes Paul's a little over my head, hard to be understood. And with a smile on my face, I want to say, Peter, you're not inferior to Paul. That's the same Holy Ghost, by the way, that inspired Paul that is also motivating Peter. Peter, you've written, please smile with me, some hard to be understood things as well. And preacher, what would those things be? Verse 6. 
verse 6. Listen to this. For this cause, here's why. For this reason was the gospel preached. Uh, that is the verb euangelizo. Euangelizo. And, and euangelion, the word gospel, it means good news. Good message. Somebody say amen. Best news I ever heard was that Jesus died on the cross to save my soul from hell. For this cause was the gospel preached. The good news preached. But here it gets tricky. Also unto them that are dead. The good news was preached also unto them that are dead. Dead. Preacher, can you explain that unto them that are dead? Let, let me read the rest of the verse. That they, the dead to whom the gospel has been preached, that they might be judged from man's side, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh. And when men get a hold of folks that have believed the gospel, the gospel was preached to them, I believe they got saved. I believe that. Men are going to tear them to shreds. Men, judged according to men in the flesh, they're going to make fun of them, belittle them, try to disprove them. They're going to even not only uh, 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 what do you say, social abuse, physical abuse. They'll throw them in jail. In fact, it's not long after Peter's day they begin killing them, martyring them that they might be judged according to men in the flesh. But they'll live. Now wait a minute, preacher. You just said they were dead. I'm reading my verse. And they will live according to God in the Spirit. Brother Bagel, that is a difficult... The gospel was preached to the dead. Let me first of all tell you what it does not mean. I don't know if that's good teaching or not. Let me tell you what it does not mean. It does not mean that people who have died, people who died rejecting Jesus as Savior will on the other side, will in the grave be given a second chance. Well, preacher, the gospel will be preached to them that it is not talking about a second chance after death. I say it is not talking about a second chance after death. Brother Bagwell, you're saying me uh, rather dogmatic that I've got a verse. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 27. It is appointed unto man. Someone said, and I think it's true, death is not an accident. Death is an appointment. God has appointed it. It is appointed unto men once to die. That disproves reincarnation. You will die once. Once to die. And after this, a second chance. After this, God will feel sorry for you and come down and, and get you out of hell. After this, the judgment. And that will be as we have discussed, the great white throne judgment cast forever into the lake of fire. No, if you're lost, perish the idea, jettison the idea. Well, if I die and find out there is a hell and there is a heaven and the Bible was right, I'll just get saved then. No, no possibility exists. So whatever verse 6 means, it does not mean the gospel will be preached to those who are dead and they will be able to utilize a second chance and I drop my paper and get saved by the grace of God. That's not what it means. Now that we've discussed what it does not mean, don't you reckon it'd be a good idea to try to figure out what it does mean? <laughs> For this cause was the gospel preached unto them that are dead. Some of the Greek teachers, and it's not adding to the Word of God. I will never do that. 
but it gives clarity to what Peter means. This simple word. Because the gospel was preached also to them that are now dead. They were not dead when the gospel was preached to them. Unless you want to look at it, they were dead in trespasses and sins. Spiritually dead and we all were that. I think he's talking about people to whom the gospel was preached when they were alive. They got saved. They got born again, washed in the blood of the Lamb. And then they died. And then they died. Let me tell you this. The gospel was preached unto them that are dead that might insinuate, I think there's a bit of this in here, they were killed for their faith. They were martyred for their faith. Their life was ended prematurely because they would not deny the Lord Jesus Christ. So now they're dead. And if not forced death and martyrdom, now the years have taken their toe and the, the gospel preached also to them that are dead. And uh, two things have happened. Number one, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh. This is what men in the flesh will say. Men in the flesh. Let me give you that synonym again. This is what the lost Gentiles will say. This is what the heathen will say. Didn't do them Christians much good, did it? They talked about Jesus coming, but look around. He didn't. Uh, they talked about having peace, but look, some of them got crucified on a cross. Some of them were stoned to death. Others we beheaded. <laughs> didn't turn out too well for them, and now they're dead. And everybody knows when you're dead, it's done. It's over with. Uh, 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 end of story. That's what the lost world says. These believers who got saved and they're now dead, their bodies now lie in the grave. They're being judged according to men, anthropos, men, human beings, lost human beings in the flesh. They're saying, sure didn't pay. The same thing the devil said about Job. It, it, it didn't pay to serve God. You let me take away all his blessings, God. Uh, it, it, you let me get where it doesn't pay to serve you. you know, that's, the, that's the only attitude the devil knows. We only serve God because it pays. The world said, didn't pay them to serve God. They're in the same graves over yonder, the same graveyard. We'll be in one of these days. In the last days, Peter writes, there will be scoffers coming saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the beginning, since creation, things have continued as a... They said Jesus is coming. He didn't. They're not, they just well have had their wild drinking parties with us. They just as well had their sexual orgies with us. They, they just well have, because it uh, didn't do them any good that they might be judged according to men in the flesh. But oh, oh, Glory to God, that's not the end of the story. May I say it again? That's not the end of the story. Excuse me. My lips get so dry. What do you mean, not the end of the story? Let's read the rest of verse 6. But, but, it's Allah, A-L-L-A, -L -L -A, a very strong adversity. But, but, world says they're in the grave. That's the end of it. Didn't do them any good. No blessing for them for serving God. But in reality, the gospel was preached to them. They died. The gospel was preached to them that aren't now dead. But now they live. Oh, wait a minute, preacher Bagel. Uh, that's a contradiction. That's an oxymoron. That's a paradox. They're dead? And you're telling me they live? Yes, Yes, somebody get me an amen ready. It's so important. If you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are, John chapter 3, you are born again. Did you hear me? You are born again. You are given, oh my, oh my. I, I, I wish I could just get up and run around the camera right now. I'm excited. You are given eternal life. He that hath the Son hath Life And what kind of life is that? It's the life the Son of God has, everlasting life. My, my. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. <laughs> they're dead, but they're alive. They're dead. Let me put it this way. Their bodies are dead, but that's all that's dead. Their spirit, their soul, get me an amen again, alive forever in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. It didn't do them any good. They're dead. And yet in reality, they're alive. They're eternally alive. They're now enjoying life more abundantly according to God in the flesh. According to man, it's useless to get saved. You know, dying, there's nothing to it. According to God, best move you ever made. According to God, wisest decision a man can contemplate and follow through. A living, but live according to God. You're going to live your life according to man. Don't get saved. It's no use. Are you going to live your life according to God? Come. Come. Come and drink of everlasting water. Come and eat the bread of life. Come unto me. I'll give you rest. Come unto me. I'll write your name down in heaven. Come unto me. I'll save your loss according to God. In the Spirit. In the Spirit. Spirit. And uh, let's talk a moment about that word spirit. It's pneuma, spelled P S P N E U M A. Let me spell it right P N E U M A, pneuma. And this is a reference, listen to me, this is a reference to the Holy Ghost of Almighty God. This is a reference to the Holy Spirit of an Almighty God. You say, Preacher Babylon, do you? Excuse me just a moment. Do you know that? Are you, are you absolutely positive that? I am absolutely positive that is a reference to the Holy Ghost of God. But it's not capitalized. I'm going to show you in a minute. In our King James Bible. And I am a King James Bible preacher. In the King James Bible. Every time the word spirit is used of the Holy Spirit. It is not necessarily capitalized. There are times it is. There are times it is not. In uh, 1611, in the 1600s, Elizabethan uh, rules of English, of grammar, uh, uh, deity was not always capitalized. It is today or ought to be today. If I'm going to write God's name, it's going to be capitalized. If I'm going to write Holy Spirit, they're going to be cap H and S going to be cap, But not in that day. It wasn't a rule of grammar. In the Holy Ghost. I lived according to the flesh. I said, this is no good. I met Jesus. He saved me. Holy Ghost moved in my life and now I live according to the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In the Spirit. I am in God the Father. I'm part of the family. I am in Christ Jesus. He's my Savior. If any man be in Christ, he's a new. And now I am in the Spirit. I am in. Holy Ghost has enveloped me. Holy Ghost is living within me. The Holy Ghost has wrapped Himself around me. Hallelujah. What a say. This, this is in reality what they are saying. The Gentiles, the law. And God's going to call them into account. God's going to send them to hell for their rejection and their rebellion and their disbelief. Them Christians... Wasted lives. They're dead. They're Christians. And, and uh, they thought it strange that we began to live a life that glorified and they blasphemed us and they persecuted us. And, and, and it's, it's still yet, there's another wave of persecution enveloping this world against God's people. My, my. And, and it's going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. No need to serve God. God said, I'll call you into account. I'll take you to the great white throne. Whether you're alive or dead, I'll get you great white throne. You'll be cast into the lake of fire for rejecting my son. But the believers, they made a right choice. They believed on the Lord Jesus with all their heart. And though many have believed, some martyred, many have believed years have gone by, they're now dead. They're not really dead. Here's what happened. Somebody say amen. Absent from the body. <laughs> absent from the body present with the Lord uh, Luke 16 
and uh, uh, the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's into the presence of the Lord. It's a blessing to be saved. 